Daniel chapter 6. I think sometimes we get in the church, we get so accustomed to the Bible that we just pass it off as Bible stories. We've got books over there that says Children's Storybook Bible. We tell our kids when we're having vacation Bible school or something, we're going to have some Bible stories. And you know, and, and I've got some stories that, that I've liked, the Black Stallion and my friend Flicka and Where the Red Fern Grows and The Man of Bronze and, you know, and, and all those stories that I read. And then we have Daniel in the lion's den and David and Goliath and Gideon in the fleece and David and Bathsheba and David and Goliath and Stephen in the stoning and Paul in the, the Damascus Road. And we have these stories, but are they just stories? I'd like to maybe show you this morning that they're more than just stories. They're very important parts of our life. The Bible says all these things were written for our example. I personally think that our Bible is a road map. One of the students in Sunday school this morning asked, well, why didn't God write more Bibles? You know? Well, I read them the back 22 Revelation the last verse, or next to the last verse, where it says that if anybody adds to or takes away, we have the completed version. The Bible said when the fullness of time was come. We, have got, we, we haven't learned to follow this one yet. What do we need another one for? You know? <clears throat> In Daniel chapter 6 and preceding, we have the story let me change that. We have the accurate account of Daniel's dealings with King Darius. And, and what had happened is Darius was the king after, I think, Nebuchadnezzar ceased to reign. And he took a liking to Daniel and his friends and he set them up as rulers over the kingdom and Daniel was the head over the rulers. And so the people there, his co-workers, plotted against him and tried to come up with things to get them in trouble. They, they tried to figure out some kind of dirt to dig up on Daniel. And the Bible says, the Bible says in verse number 4, then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. And what I found out, if people can't find anything wrong with you, they'll make up something with you. And so don't get discouraged and don't get depressed. What I'm going to do this morning is we're going to take chapter 6 and we're going to break it down into yours and my daily life. So it won't be one of my run and jump and scream and slobber sermons. I'll probably just stand up here most of the day, which will be highly unusual. Um... And it may actually scare some of you. I noticed this morning that the church is fuller toward the front, which is a really good thing. I like having people up here within reaching distance. And uh, so, so I, I like it when you're up here. It's really cool. And uh, so I appreciate it. Al said he's going to eventually convince everybody to move up here. And so I was in one church one time that they figured out a way to get people closer to the front as they took out the back row. Well, what they didn't understand is the next row became the back row, but whatever, you know. Anyway, so these guys, they, they plotted to find an, an accusation against Daniel. Now, Daniel had a bad habit. And it's, it's probably a bad habit that, that we would probably be good to adopt. Daniel had a habit of praying. Insomuch that the people knew that he had a habit of praying. Insomuch that the fact that they went and plotted with the king, because the king wasn't really thinking about the habit of Daniel at the time when the other presidents and stuff went to talk to the king. And they said, hey king, we got a really cool idea for you. Let's make a decree that for 30 days, anybody found asking any god or any person or any ruler, any petition of anybody except you. Because you know how we like to be uplifted and we like to be exalted. You start telling people how pretty they are and pretty soon they start to believe it. 
You know, uh, you start telling people how smart they are, pretty soon they start to believe it. And if you don't believe that, you try it with a child sometime. You tell them how stupid they are, pretty soon they'll start to believe how stupid they are. You start to tell people, battered wives, abused wives, uh, and husbands, my kids found out this past week uh, how, how seriously abused I am. Um, see, they just see the sweet side of Rose. But, but they, they caught her yesterday, you know. Uh, Rose was Rose was being very mean to me again yesterday, but she was doing it in public yesterday, and 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 uh, you know, and, and 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 my baby my my baby girl asked me. She said, "Mommy's so mean to you. Why?" And I and I said, "Cause she's mean." <laughs> you know, she's. I said, "Y'all just see the sweet side of her." <laughs> but anyway, for you internet folks, I love her to death. I'm just teasing. But uh, anyway. For you church folks, I'm serious. Y'all feel sorry for me. <laughs> but, but your worldly opposition should be expected. Don't you expect to be the most popular person in your workplace as long as you maintain your Christianity? You're a guilt factor to those working around you. If they know you have a habit of praying, if they know you have a habit of praising, if they know you have a habit of church attendance, if they know you have a habit of godly living, if they know you have a habit of trying to stay away from sin instead of staying in sin, you're going to become the target. So don't let it surprise you. And so Daniel wasn't surprised. He didn't have an opinion one way or the other. And so when they went to the king and said, King, we got this really cool idea for you to be uplifted and exalted. If anybody prays to or talks to or asks anything of anybody other than you, let's throw them in the lion's den. And that momentary pride issue of Darius the king, he said, that's a great idea. Let's sign off on it. Be careful what you sign off on. <laughs> anyway, they went on down and went on down and went on down. Verse number 8, Now, O king, establish a decree and sign the writing that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which all there's not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, verse number 10, Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Daniel knew that a new law had been passed. You pray, you're lying food. But Daniel had a habit of praying. We need to make a habit of attendance. We need to make a habit of giving her offering. I was talking to Kevin this morning. I'm not saying it to pat him on the back because Lord knows I don't want to do that. But when he was just a young Christian, he would have real troubles with writing a church to writing a check to the church. Writing a tithe check to the church. And and he struggled with that for for a while. And and now he said this morning I was watching him and he borrowed a pen to write out his tithe check. And he said, you know that's probably the easiest check I write out now. Because it's become a habit. To give your tithes and offerings to God because you know that the blessings are going to come. And, and we know as, as we pray, it becomes a habit to pray because we know God hears and answers prayers. He may not hear and answer it in your time or in my time, but He hears and answers our prayers. We've seen that three or four times just this past week. We kept a list about a month ago and in one short week, 15 of the 25 prayer requests have been answered. So we know that God hears and answers prayers. It's not what God has done, but what is God doing? We see little Sonia back there. She's born four pounds and something. And they were worried about whether she was actually going to live or not. Now she's her grandma's apple of her eye. She's sitting there sleeping peacefully in God's house. And it's in God's house. It's why she's here today in God's house. Because her mom was raised in this church and she wants to make sure that her baby's in God's house. So Daniel was, 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 as his habit was, he was praying. And he wasn't making it a secret. Now, I can see some of our lives. Now when the decree was signed and Daniel knew that the writing was signed, we went into our house, shut the doors, shut our windows, crawled up under the beds, we kept our eyes open and we made sure nobody knew we were praying. But Daniel didn't. Daniel did as his habit was. He went into his bedroom where the windows were flung wide open. And he prayed. He might have been like me. He might have been a little Pentecostal Baptist. And prayed loud. <laughs> you know. And, and, and so when he was praying, notice what he did when he was praying. Three times a day, prayed and gave thanks before his God. 
Lord, I thank you that tomorrow I'll probably be lying food. He knew that the writing had been signed. He knew that people were out to get him. He knew that there was a plot against him. He knew that he was probably signing his own death warrant. But he thanked God. I asked the kids in Sunday school this morning, how many of you picked up your Bibles and read it this past week? None of them did. Ben found some old old Bibles or something and he said he might have read a verse. (laughs) And I wonder how many of us adults have picked up our Bibles this past week and read them. I wonder how many of us have a habit of thanking God every morning before we go to that hill hole we call a workplace. Gee, Lord, thank You for my job. Thank You for the opposition I'm going to face today. Thank You for the problems I'm going to have with my children today. Thank You for the problem I'm going to have with my co-workers today. Thank You, God, for the two folks that are doing all kinds of things to try to disrupt my life and my life this morning. Lord, thank You for them. Thank You for them keeping me in check because I need to make sure my testimony stands strong. Al said a while ago about, about the tragedies in our life draw our closer to Him. God, God's got a purpose. If we won't listen to reason, He'll bring a little strife in. You know, like I said, I jumped off the wagon a few times. God has a way of getting us back on the wagon. Sometimes it's by invitation. He'll slow the wagon down and say, you want to get back on? How many? I know we're in the wrong area to be doing this, but how many of you ever rode in the back of a pickup truck? <laughs> we all survived, didn't we? How many of you ever slept in the back window of the floorboard of a car? Yeah. You know, how many of you had lead paint, spankings, wooden spoons, all night? We all survived, didn't we? You know, these bunch of pansies running around now. About half of them need a good spanking. But I remember riding in the back of the pickup on the way back and forth from town or whatever, and we we get this bright idea, we're just going to jump off, you know, and run behind. I mean, you tried to hold on to the tailgate while you're running behind the truck. None of y'all were that stupid, okay. That was just, that was just, oh, you did too? Okay. Oh, yeah, you slide, you just hold on. We just... We used to wait till the mailman rode by and then we'd take a, a rope and hook it around his, his ball on the back of his truck and we'd slid down the road behind him. He'd never know we were there. But anyway, yeah, we, we survived. You know? We rode our bikes without helmets. We jumped off the rocks into the river. We, we did all kinds of things. Who ever heard of a seatbelt? The first thing you did when you bought a new car was take seatbelts out, use them for something worthwhile like dog collars and things. <laughs> now, man, anyway, shut up, Randy. Just go on with the preaching. Anyway, these men assembled and found Daniel praying. That must, to me, that means that they were standing by just waiting. They were just watching and waiting. Because they knew, as his habit was, three times a day he went and prayed. And so I would imagine they were, they were probably there on the first watch. Just waiting. Then they came near the king, and the king said, You know, you've signed a petition, now he's got to be cast into the alliance. Then they answered and said before the king that Daniel is the children of captivity of Judah regardeth thee not, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed and maketh his petition three times a day. Verse number 14. Then when the king heard these words, he was sore displeased with whom? Himself. Because he'd been trapped. And he set his heart on delivering Daniel. And he labored from the going down of the sun to the river. He, he wished he hadn't said what he said. You ever been there? You ever, you, ever, you ever felt those words go across your teeth and you just wished you could just, Nyang! come back here. Yeah. Notice, we have all kind of, anybody ever seen a picture of Daniel in the lion's den? You know, what artist depicted this picture of Daniel? Okay. You, you see all kinds of pictures. You see Daniel sitting there on his knees praying. You see Daniel standing there before him. You see Daniel. One of my favorite pictures of Daniel in the lion's den is you've got all the, the lions laying around. And they're all looking at Daniel. And Daniel is standing there and there's, there's a ray of light coming from somewhere. And I know in the literal Bible story, no, I'm sorry, in the literal accurate depiction of Daniel in the lion's den, there wasn't any ray of light because the king sealed it, remember? And he put his signet on it. And so I'm, I'm pretty sure there wasn't a ray of light coming through there. But in the artist's depiction of that, there's a ray of light. And, and, and what I see in the picture is I see all of the lions focused on Daniel. And I see Daniel focused on God. And I, I was reading the story to the young folks this morning of Stephen. 
And the Bible says that they all picked up their rocks and they were gnashing their teeth on him and they ran on him and took him out of the city and they were throwing stones at him. And in and, and my, my, my remembrance of throwing stones at people, you had to be looking at your target. And so their focus was on Stephen, but the Bible says that Stephen looked steadfastly in the heaven. His focus wasn't on the rocks. His focus was on God. And I, and I think about, about Peter when he got out of the boat. And the Bible says that he walked on the water. And his focus was not on the waves, but his focus was on Jesus. And when his focus got off Jesus, he began to sink. And, and, and I think about how David was there with Goliath. And, 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 and Goliath was there, and he was checking David out, and he was talking about his rocks, and he was talking about his sling. And David said, you come to me with a spear and a sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. Goliath's focus was on David, but David's focus was on God. And, and Daniel's focus was not on the king or the king's decree. Daniel's focus was not on the lions, but Daniel's focus was on God. And I'm going to give you a little secret that you can share with people if you want to. If you keep your focus on God, all the rest of the stuff will fall into place. But as long as you focus on the classroom or the office attitude or the mayoral candidates or the problems at work or the 4-H fair or the problems in your house or, or whatever happens to be going on in your life, if your focus is on that, that's what you're going to be concentrating on. If your focus is on your finances and not on God, you're going to be worried every day. If your focus is on your health and not on God, you're going to be worried about that every day. If your focus is on your children and not on God, you're going to be worried about that every day. You see, where our focus is. And, and the king, notice, notice what happened with the king. Verse number 16. Then the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. And now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, He will deliver thee. See, see, the king was speaking that his God, Daniel's God, not his God, not Darius' God, but Daniel's God would deliver him. Darius didn't have the faith in Daniel's God that Daniel had in his God. But because it doesn't say anything about Daniel stressing out, it doesn't say anything about Daniel biting and catching, kicking and scratching and trying to keep himself out of the lion's den. And if you look at all of the pictures that are done, Daniel's just chilling out in the lion's den, and the lions are walking around looking like, okay, where's my meal coming from? Because this ain't it. You know, it's like somebody put broccoli on my plate when I'm hungry. That broccoli ain't got a thing to worry about. Now, chicken run across the yard, he better put it in high gear. You know, but but but. A stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and the signet of his lords and the purpose that it might not be changed concerning Daniel. Now, what I want you to see is verse number 18. Then the king went to his palace, and he passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. You can face your trials and troubles with or without God. Daniel faced his troubles with God. And he was just chilling in the lions' den. The lions were focused on Daniel, but Daniel was focused on God. The king couldn't get any peace. The king couldn't get any sleep. The king couldn't get any, any rest. The king spent his night fasting and worrying and rolling back and forth and agonizing back and forth. How many nights have you spent agonizing back and forth because your focus was on the stuff instead of on your God? How many sleepless nights have you and I experienced because our focus wasn't on God where it was supposed to be? How many times did we stop three times a day as our habit was so we could have a peaceful night's rest? Apparently the king didn't have that kind of reputation. The king apparently was a good man and he respected Daniel and Daniel's reputation. And he respected Daniel's God because he had seen Daniel's God working in Daniel's life. But you can stand on the outside and look in all day long, but it won't belong to you. See, the king knew about Daniel's God. Daniel knew his God. And I'm very sad to say today that there's probably a whole lot of people sitting in God's house today that are just visiting. They don't belong. Because the children belong in God's house. See, this is not the evangelistic ground. This is the training ground. Out there is the evangelistic ground. Oh, I agree we bring sinners into church at every opportunity, but they're out there watching your day-to-day -day life. 
They're watching to see what your habit is daily. They're watching to see what your prayer life is like daily. They're watching to see what your stress like is daily. They're watching to see how you react to problems daily. They're watching to see how you react to circumstances and strife and tribulation in your life to see whether your God is real or not. See, see, the king had found enough faith in Daniel's God to believe that Daniel's God would preserve him. I don't know whether he actually believed it or not if he was just saying it and trying to encourage Daniel. Apparently, he didn't believe it as much as he sounded like he believed it because if he did, he'd do like my dad did when I broke down in the mountains. I, had a, I was preaching all over the mountains of North Carolina and it was about 1.30 in the morning and I was coming home and I called my dad and said, you know, Pray for me. I, I, if I don't make it home by about 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm stuck somewhere along the journey because my alternator light keeps coming on and my lights keep going dim in the van. And so my battery may go down and my alternator may go out. And so him and Mom got up and a few minutes later, Dad went back down to the bedroom and laid back down across the bed. Mom said, what are you doing? Why aren't you getting ready to go get him? He said, I already prayed about it. Dad. God's got it taken care of. I'm going to bed. You see, the king had told Daniel, your God will deliver you. But he didn't really believe it. Talking to Rose the other day, and we were talking about telling people different things about, you know, it's going to be all right, God has told me this or whatever. And, and Rose, a particular situation, that somebody had called her and asked her to pray about something or, or something, and she said she just knew in her spirit that it was going to be okay. But she was hesitant to tell that person that it was going to be okay because... You don't ever know whether God's going to come through or not, right? But the king told Daniel that it's going to be okay. But he didn't believe it was going to be okay. Because if he had been believed it was going to be okay, then he'd have went to bed and went back to sleep too. I don't know what Daniel was doing in the lion's den. It doesn't say. But I'm pretty sure he wasn't freaking out. I'm pretty sure he wasn't doing like Russell was doing up here in Sunday school this morning when he's talking. You know, does that pretty much what you were? I, I forgot. He, I walked in in the last few seconds, so I'm not sure exactly what he was talking about. But I don't know if he was talking about you know Ray doing that or if he was talking about himself doing that or what. You know, but he was he was he was you know making them crying motions to God. You know, I don't think Daniel was doing that. I might be wrong, as it's been proven. I have been wrong before. <laughs> But but I, I don't I, I just don't picture Daniel in the lion's den freaking out. And none of the pictures I've seen, and I've seen hundreds of them. I went through the internet yesterday, and the internet's always right. <laughs> I went through hundreds of pictures. I think it was Thursday or Friday, just looking at images of Daniel in the lion's den, and not one single one of them saw Daniel going. Ah! <laughs> not not one single one of them saw a lion tasting Daniel. <laughs> you know. But all of the pictures from folks that are a whole lot smarter than I am saw Daniel either standing or sitting calmly and the lions either walking around or laying around or whatever. Oh, with a chair on him. Yeah. <laughs> Could have been. Daniel was the first lion tamer. Who knows? You know. Pow! <laughs> but what I do see is the king freaking out. And, and what I see is the two levels of faith. And that's what I want to say this morning. I was wondering what I wanted to say, and I think that's probably what I want to say. Is there's two levels of faith in our lives. The faith that either gives us a good night's sleep, or the faith that keeps us up all night. The king had faith, but it kept him up all night. Daniel had faith. And from what I understand, and, and the reason I, I kind of go that direction is because verse number 22. Well, start in verse 21. No, back up to 20. Back up to 19. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried in a lamentable or sad voice unto Daniel, and to the king spoke and said unto Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lion's question mark? I don't know if you got one in your Bible or not. But it wasn't a statement of fact. 
It wasn't said, okay, Daniel, since you've lived through the night, come on out. It's, Daniel, was your God able to deliver you? The one you serve continually? The one you pray to three times a day? The one who your habit is to worship? Was He really able to deliver you? And we have questions in our lives every single day of people watching your life. Is your God really able to take care of your situation? Is your God... We've watched your faith. We've watched your habit. But is your God really able to take care of this latest problem that we've thrown at you? Is your God really able to take care of you when the grant ends? Is your God really able to take care of you when the class list doesn't match your wish list? Is your God really able to take care of you when the candidate you didn't want gets elected? Is your God really able to take care of you when you get that bill that you weren't expecting? Rose handed me a bill. Come into my, she says, this came to the ark. What's it all about? I said, well, it's, we owe $911 more dollars to unemployment insurance is what it's about. Wasn't expecting that. But my God is able. My God is able. The king says, Daniel, was he, was he, was he, are, are, are you, are you okay? Were you able to survive the night? And then Daniel says, oh king, live forever, it's cool in here. We're just having a kitty party. My God has sent His angel and shut the lion's mouth. And they've not hurt me for as much as before Him. Innocent was found in me. Daniel said, I ain't deserve to be here, so God took care of me. I didn't deserve to be here, so God took care of me. God sent His angel. I don't know which angel He sent. I know he was praying a little while later and a whole bunch of angels was trying to get there and he couldn't, couldn't quite get there for the, for the force of Satan that was trying to hinder him. But then Michael showed up. So I ain't, you know, I don't know which angel showed up, but I pitied the lion <laughs> if Michael showed up. Of course, I pitied the lion if most any angel of God showed up. Because it says he shut their mouth. So apparently the lion was trying to open his mouth. You know, I have, you know, I train puppies and when I'm teaching them not to bite, I take them by the nose and just under the, just under the jawline, you know, where your thumb fits in there between them two bones. And I close their mouth and I tell them, no bite. And I, and I, and I keep doing it, no bite. And if they continue to try to bite, I get harder. No bite. You know, and, and, and I don't know, maybe you had some lions in there that was kind of hard headed like some of the puppies I've raised. And some of them angels just reached up there and just, just, just grabbed that lion and said, no bite. <laughs> you know, and maybe maybe one of them tried to push you a little bit. I don't know. I said no bite. <laughs> you know. I, I don't know. I wasn't there. But I know that God showed up. Because Daniel said plainly there. My God. My God has sent his angel. Do you have a faith that keeps you up all night? Or do you have a faith that gives you rest in the presence of danger? I don't know about y'all. You know, I, I like lions. We have lions here in Montana. We've got some out by the house. And, and, I, and I like lions. I just destroyed, just destroyed my grandkids now. They'll never go outside again. But I, I, like, I like my mountain lions down by the river. I like my mountain lions out there. I hear them cry and scream, whatever. They've never bothered anything, and I, and I like them. I don't want them in my living room. I don't want to be in their living room. <laughs> but Daniel was in a whole den of them. And I don't know if you know anything about the historical records of lion's den, but they didn't feed them until they threw some folks in there. And so if you, I think if you read the rest of the chapter, I didn't do it today, but I think if you read the rest of the chapter, that, that the folks that were um, throwing him in there, when the king found out that Daniel was okay, he chunked them other ones in there. And they got to eat before they got the ground. So it won't that the lions won't hungry. 
Matter of fact, there it is, verse number 24. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast him into the den of lions, their children and their wives, and the lions had to master them and break all their bones in pieces ever before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Them were some hungry lions. You know, it's kind of like the angels just kind of stepped back and said, okay, it's feeding time. You know, we got that one little bulldog at the house and she eats like she's never going to get another meal in her life. I mean, you put the food down there, man, and she's just... And food goes... <laughs> she goes everywhere. And you know, and I, and I see these lions who, when Daniel's on the outside of the lion's den, and remember, it's not just another Bible story. It's a factual account of how God rescued His children. It's a factual account of something that went on in Bible times. It's a factual record of how God preserves His children. And God has not changed. He said, I am the same forevermore. Jesus said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same lions that attack Daniel are still trying to attack you on a daily basis. And the same angel that shut their mouths are the same angel that can shut their mouths in your life. But is your faith one that keeps you up all night? Or is your faith one that lets you rest peacefully? See, these are more than just Bible stories. And you can face your troubles with or without God. And oftentimes it's your choice. Because it's like I told you before the service started. You determine the kind of day you're going to have. You're either going to have a joyous day or you're going to have a miserable day. And it's your choice. Circumstances and situations shouldn't change our day. They do, but they shouldn't. It's like that thermostat sitting over on the wall. That thermostat is supposed to control the temperature in this room. Too many of us are thermometers instead of thermostats. We go up and down with the situations instead of controlling our situations. There's a southern gospel song that says in essence, stop telling God how big your problem is and start telling your problem how big your God is. I think sometimes we keep running to God whining and crying about how big our problem is instead of letting our problem know how big our God is. David focused on Jesus and Goliath failed. Daniel focused on God and the lions were silent. Peter focused on Jesus and he walked on the water. Stephen focused on God and the rocks didn't hurt him. They killed him, but they didn't hurt him. There's a difference. See, the whole time the rocks were flying, he was focused on Jesus. He said, I see Jesus standing. The last thing he said before he fell asleep was, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge because they don't know what they're doing. You see, you can focus on stuff. You can focus on all the rocks flying at you. I had about eight or ten paper wads laying on the table this morning and I heard everything from couldn't make up your mind what you were preaching today or, you know. But those paper wads I used as examples and I kept throwing them at the kids. And I said, you're, you're ugly. You're four eyes. You're fat. You'll never be anything. You know. And you're going to get, you're going to get stones thrown at you. You're going to get you're worthless. You're going to get we don't need you. You're going to get you'll never amount to anything. You're going to get all of those rocks on it. But are you going to see Jesus? Or are you going to focus on God? You're going to get all kinds of opposition. As long as you try to serve God, think it not strange these fiery trials that have afflicted you. You're going to get trials. You're going to get tribulation. You're going to get persecution. Are you going to focus on that? Or are you going to focus on God? Are you going to focus on the lions? Or are you going to focus on God? Are you going to focus on the wind boisterous? Or are you going to focus on Jesus? You see, what what are we going to focus on? Are you going to have the kind of faith that lets you sleep peacefully? Or are you going to have the kind of faith that keeps you up all night? 
I'd much rather have the faith that lets me sleep peacefully. I've had the kind of faith that I stay up all night. I've had the kind of faith that I sit out in my rocking chair and wonder, how long have I got to go through this, Lord? I've had the kind of faith that you just sit there and stare at the sun hoping you go blind. You know, I've had I've had that kind of faith. But I, I, I like the faith that, Lord, I know you got this. I'm going to bed now. Lord, I, I know you got this. I'm going to go on with my work. Lord, I know you got this. So I'm going to do the best job I can do. And let the chips fall where they may. I, I, I want that kind of faith on a daily basis. I want, I want Daniel's as his habit was, praying three times a day, no matter what the decree was. See, they're not just Bible stories. It's not just Gideon and the fleece. It's not just Moses and the Red Sea. It's not just Peter walking on the water. It's not just Joshua and the walls of Jericho coming down. They're not just Bible stories. They're examples to show us that our God is in control of every single situation you and I can face every single day. There are no surprises. Jerry, I don't know if you're going to watch this or not, but your situation did not surprise God. Quit getting mad. We face things every day and God is still in control. God was in control before you were born. God will be in control after you're gone. But God is in control of our lives. It doesn't matter what's going on in our lives. God has not lost control. Our world seems to have gone stupid overnight. You know, I saw a little cartoon the other day. Matter of fact, I told Rose about it this morning. She thought it was actually true, and it wouldn't surprise me if it was. They took down the statue of McDonald's because the Taco Bell was offended about it. You know, you know. We, 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 our, our country has just gone absolutely berserk. But God's still in control. You know, it, it's kind of like having rats for pets. You know? They're crazy and running around in their maze, but they're still, you know, we still got to live for the maze. God, God's still in control. And I know yours and my world seems like it's going to hell in a handbasket, but God is in control. The trouble is, is do we have fretful faith or do we have real faith? Do we have the faith that lets us sleep peacefully or do we have the faith that keeps us up all night? Lord, we thank You so very much for You being in control and not us.